and then we're going to pray. I want you to think about some things as we do. The love of the Lord is always abound with us and on us. And you hear me talk about forgiveness, and we've talked about that, and we've talked about his love. And Thursday, I talked about his mercy, and I told you how mercy also means thank you. So today, I want to talk to you about this season a bit, not so much the story of Christ, but just to let you know how important it is for the forgiveness and the treasures of, of Christ, the treasures of Christ, the forgiveness and the treasures of Christ. That's just one of the gifts the forgiveness is. And then there comes love because when he came, his whole mission, his focus, his goal was to come for us and forgive us for our wretchedness and bring us into the marvelous light. So then this became the blessing. So I love it when the prophet Daniel speaks about these things and how he came to God to reconcile us with God. Even before Christ, God was always using his prophets to foretold and to foretell about the coming of our Lord and Savior. So I want to talk to you about that a little bit. And I want to take a minute to read some of Daniel's message as he petitioned the Lord, as he told the Lord how wretched we were, but then it was all about his great name. So as we get into this today, let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just come before you right now, asking that you touch our hearts, that you move in such a way that we begin to revelate and know more of you and understand why our Savior is so important to us and why we must honor him in the seasons that you have designated us to do. So, Father, we just bless you right now in Jesus' name. Well, glory to God, dear ones. And I again, I want to talk about the forgiveness, the treasures of Christ, the actual blessing of it all. Amen. So let's take off at Daniel chapter 9. And I'm going to look at verse 17. That's Daniel chapter 9. And he talks to us in this way. He says, now our God, hear our prayers, hear the prayers, the petitions, the supplications. This is something that you hear me say all the time about why Bible study is so significant because it's an opportunity for us to bring our prayers, our petitions, and our supplications. And here's Daniel praying to our Lord for us, not only for us, for himself, but we know Daniel was simply unblemished. He walked before God in a perfect anointing. I love that about Daniel. It always touches my heart how God used him to even foretold and foretell the message and why God is so merciful. So he says, now our God hear the petitions, the prayers and the supplications of your servant, of your servant, Daniel. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolation or desolate sanctuary. So we've got a lot of work. Revelation talks about the churches, doesn't it? how we all may be doing or feel like we're doing well, but then there's always something that we lack. So Daniel knew to pray in this like manner. He says, for your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary. God, we just pray right now that your face shines on the church, on the churches, Father that you bless us, oh God, and cause us to walk in this anointing, cause us to know, God, that you're with us and that everything is going to be all right. This is a season, I say, to really understand the birthing of Christ and know how important, I say, 
again. It is. So he says, for your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary and cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary. Shine upon us, God. Give ear then to our prayers, our supplications, our petitions. Give ear, God. Oh, Father, oh, God, our God, and hear. Hear us, Father. Hear our prayers. Open your eyes then and see us right now, God, and see the desolate of the cities that bear your name. Oh, somebody receive this prayer in your home this morning. Know that God is speaking to you. Know that Daniel prayed for you and me, just as Jesus did on the cross. We see now how God always walks things out for us to get a better understanding as to how he continued to warn us and how he continued to prepare us to be saved. But he says, we do not make requests or supplications of you because of our righteousness. But I say we do this for thy great mercy's sake. So this is why we were talking about mercy last Thursday, because now we begin to see that these great mercies or avail or made to us, made whole to us, made available to us. We even have, and I've mentioned the mercies of David. Grab hold of the mercies today. Regardless as to where you're, you're at and where you've been, it doesn't matter. Grab hold of the mercies today and read, I say, and understand the prayer of Daniel and how he prayed petitiously and to God, seeking God in a special anointed way. We know about Daniel. This is the same Daniel who was in the lion's den. Anybody ever felt like they was in the lion's den? Well, Daniel was able to get out unscathed, just as his brothers, the Hebrew boys, his Christian brothers. So then we see and understand the significant, I say, of Daniel. But he says, we do not make requests, God, or supplications or prayers because we are righteous. We're not. We know that. We're a work in progress. And Daniel knew this even back then as he prayed for his ancestors, his fathers, his family, for Israel, for Jerusalem, asking God to forgive not only him, but us and them. But God heard Daniel. We know that because he sent the angel Gabriel to again foretold and foretell the things that are to come. And here we are, ready to receive our Lord and Savior, because this was part of the things that are to come. Lord, then I say, for thy mercy's sake, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, forgive. Saints, would you say that with me? O oh, listen, Lord. O oh Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. O oh Father, do your will in our lives. Forgive, listen. Oh, make your ears attentive and your eyes open to us, Lord. Hear and act. For your sake, God, for you, God, for your sake, my God, do not delay or defer because your city and your people bear your name, oh God. Oh God, my God, for thy city, thy people are called. Somebody say, I'm called. Are called by your name. Oh, bless the Lord, saints, for that. Bless the Lord and bless Daniel for that prayer because it is a powerful prayer for us. Please, I say, study it and let it permeate your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit, that God might, as he did with Daniel, he heard Daniel, even as he began to speak, the angel Gabriel showed up. Who else did the angel Gabriel show up to? Oh, our loving mother, Mary. Oh, glory to God and Jesus. And Jesus is for this season. Oh, saints of God, I just love God for what he does. 
in his word and in the spirit. Praise the Lord. Let's talk a little bit more about this thing of blessings. When they saw the star, this is in Matthew's, as you know, Matthew's chapter two. He says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. So when we begin to really let Jesus in our heart, we can understand the great joy. This is, I'm always saying, because it's scriptural as well, this is where we get our strength. It is the joy of the Lord. When we allow Jesus in our hearts, we begin to receive the joy of the Lord. I love this about Christ. Saints of God, some of you have been sitting back and waiting on things to do or mean things to happen for you. And it's, it, does, it doesn't happen, does it? It doesn't take place. And what did we say before? And you've heard me say this. Any decision that you make, it's not a bad decision. The bad decision is the one you do not make. God is waiting for you to step out. Oh, my God. To step out on faith. God is looking to you to do this. So then we must rejoice and let Christ in our hearts. And I say to you, and when they, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary. These are the wise men. These are the wise men that came and they saw and was looking for Christ. And they found him. I say, you are now, you've been looking for Christ, but I say that you were lost, but now you are found. You're beginning to understand that you too can find Christ in your heart. He's been there all along. You've just not opened your mouth to give him praise. Oh my God. You have not opened your mouth to say, thank you, Lord, for your mercies, because he's there. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your truth. Thank you, Lord, for your love and kindness that oh, always bestows on me. And let me know that I am somebody in you. Oh, somebody, that is so good. God, and when they would come into the house, they came into the house, the house of Christ. They saw the young child with Mary and fell down and worshiped him as they should, as we should. And when they had opened their treasures. Oh my God, there it is. What did we say? Oh, hallelujah, the forgiveness and then the treasures because Christ is always there to forgive you and then the treasures of the Lord. The treasures, I say, which are the blessings of the Lord because the treasures are not always monetary. The treasures are your prosperity, the saving grace of you that God has. But this in case was material treasures that God, oh, allow the people of God to bring, to recognize, I say, the king. So then when they worship him and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts. They presented their blessings. They, they presented gold and frankincense and myrrh. Praise the Lord. So when you, I say, children of God, when you come unto the king, you must always, you must always bear a gift. Oh, somebody, somebody say, well, pastor, I don't have much to give, but have you not heard the song, the little drama boy? Then you give what you have to Christ. You must, I say, you must recognize the king. Hallelujah. So bring a gift. Hallelujah. Let your heart be filled, what? With joy. Come unto the Lord, our savior, the king and come bearing gifts of your heart. That's why he says, do not give, hallelujah, do not give, I say, unsparingly. Give really good from your heart. Be a cheerful giver in the name of Jesus. But here's another story in Samuel that I found very interesting at the time when I was studying this. I even saw that everyone recognizes the man of God. Then they recognize the king. The story in Samuel talks about how the servant, how Saul and his servant was looking for their donkeys. They had lost them actually. And then the servant replied to him and says, 
look, in this town, there's a man of God who is highly respected, and everything he says come true. Oh, hallelujah. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take, what way to go. Oh, somebody. The Bible tells us, he says, trust in the Lord. Lean not to thine own understanding. Commit all thy ways to him, and he, I say, shall direct your path. So these men were looking for something, and they knew to go seek the man of God. He says, perhaps he will tell us what road, what path to take. So then the servant said, he says, if we go, what can we give the man? Oh, somebody. Even like I said, the wise men understood. What can we give our Lord and Savior? What can we give the man of God? Let us go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what we shall do. And if we go, what can we give him? The food in our sacks is gone. Notice they didn't have anything they thought. Oh, somebody. And then he says, if we go, what can we give him? And then the servant answered him again. Look, oh, somebody, he says, I have a quarter of shekel. Isn't that amazing? That reminds me of another story. Jesus told Peter, he says, go and look. <laughs> go and look into the water, the sea, and catch a fish, and you will find a shekel there in the fish mouth. God will always, hallelujah, I fell the Holy Ghost. God will always give you something to give him. All you have to do is have your heart stayed on him, his heart, your heart ready for him to receive whatever it is he's getting ready to give you. God will prepare your heart to give to him. God prepares your heart to praise him. God prepares your heart to worship him. Are you hearing me, dear ones? Notice this brother, this servant, he looked in his pocket. He says, I will, I, I will give the man of God that he will tell us what we need to do, what way we should take. So he obviously found the shekel in his pocket. Who knows, was that a miracle? Hallelujah. Was that a sign? I'm sure in some form or fashion it was in this case because they didn't have any food to give him, but all of a sudden he says, wait a minute, I found something in my pocket to give unto our Lord. Hallelujah to give unto the man of God. Hallelujah, saints. Are you understanding what I'm saying today? Are you really allowing God's word to work in your heart today? Let's talk a little bit more about these three things that the wise men bought unto him. Gold, gold, dear ones, hallelujah, is the color of success. You hear me talk about these things all the time. The color of gold represents success, achievement, and triumph. This is what they gave unto our Lord and Savior. And then there was frankincense. It represents spiritual good, spiritual goodness. And, and good is that which reigns in all truth, because good the Lord is. And then pure frankincense, he talks about it like this. He says, pure frankincense, signifies that which has been clarified. I like that. That sounds so good. He says, pure frankincense signifies that which has been clarified <laughs> from falsehoods of evil. The enemy will tell you lies. We know that. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. But these particular gifts represented all oh, somebody, our Lord and our Savior. He says that it signified that which has been clarified. Is it not clear to you that Christ came to save us? Is it not clear to you that this is the true season of our Lord and Savior who was birthed? And not only was he birthed, he was birthed also in us, in our hearts, in our spirits, our minds. We are to carry him throughout our lives because it represents the false hood. It represents the, the falsehoods of evil being destroyed. Are you hearing me? Because when he came, then we were able to be saved. We were lost until he came. So he came to destroy the falsehoods of evil because we know the devil will lie. 
we know he will beguile you. But Christ, when you think on these things, then those falsehoods of evil will leave you. When you submit what the word says, submit thyself unto the Lord. And then and only then can you resist the devil. You can resist then the falsehoods of evil. Glory to God. The third one, the third item that was delivered to Christ was the word or the item myrrh. Myrrh means distilled, and it also means bitterness. This is very significant. It, it, it signifies and clarifies. <laughs> I might, I'm gonna have to use that one. Y'all gonna have to hear that for a little while because that is so good. But it, the word myrrh, I say to you, represents distill and bitterness. Let's talk about that for a minute as it represents the, the life that, that Christ gave us and then died for us. During the Messiah's final agonizing hours in the Garden of Gethsemane, the weight of the world's sin crushed our Savior like a wine press, causing him to, 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 to oh, somebody, causing him to sweat great tears of blood. His bitter suffering, remember, myrrh represents the meaning of bitterness and distill. His bitter suffering then can be compared to myrrh, a highly prized spice used for, check it out, for perfumes and incense. It is extracted by piercing the tree's hardwood and allowing the gum to trickle. Anybody ever seen a tree that has sap? This is an example. I'm just giving you an example so you can picture this or and imagine it in your mind. He says, he says his bitter suffering can be compared to myrrh, a highly prized spice used for perfumes and incense today. It's extracted by piercing the trees, hardwood, and allowing the gum to trickle out and harden into bitter aromatic red droplets called tears. See the significant there? See how that clarified that and how myrrh represents our Lord and Savior. So these gifts was very important because it defines who Christ is and what he did for us. So then he says, when the myrrh flowed from the tree, it is distilled in bitterness. Do you understand that? Did that make sense for somebody? Did that clarify something for somebody? Did you take hold of that? As joint heirs then, with the Messiah, we are to share his afflictions according to the word of God. Corinthians talks about it so that we, his bride, we, his bride, can triumph through the bitterness of suffering. See, you thought all of your suffering and all the things that you went through or going through was in vain. No, it's to, it's to edify you. It's to also edify the church. How so, Pastor? By the testimony. Once you have gone through it and you've been delivered from it, you become a testimony for the church. You become a testimony for others. Are you hearing me? So then as joint heirs with the Messiah, we are to share his afflictions according to the word, according to Corinthians, so that his bride can be triumphant through the bitterness of suffering. Myrrh also represents the bitterness or the bitter suffering of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Jesus. As a man on earth, whereby he learned disobedience, no saints, he learned obedience. He learned about your disobedience, but he learned obedience. Because he walked with God, God wanted him to experience all kinds of sin put before him. But then he did not partake of any. 
he was perfect in every way. So then that's why we say to our Lord and Savior, walk before me. Walk before me and then you can be ye perfect. Walk before me, Jesus, and be ye holy because I too can be ye holy. So you have to understand that God says that murk represents the bitter suffering of Yeshua as a man on earth, whereby he learned obedience unto death by emptying himself of his own will to us. I can picture when he was on that cross and how it was, and yet this is what happens, saints, when, when you are having a rough time to forgive people then you need to picture Christ on that cross being tormented, being stabbed, being beaten, and all kinds of manner of evil being put upon him and spit on and being treated as if he was actually nothing. He was treated worse than somebody walking on the dirt. So when you are going through and you feel like people are against you and you feel like you, they won't, you know, and you can't forgive them, then you need to remind yourself about Christ, how he was on that cross and how he gave his life, not only for us, but his words, his words was, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. All oh, saints of God, that is so touching. It becomes a whole matter for me because it's easier for me to forgive. This is why I was talking to you about the forgiveness and then the treasures and then the blessings of God. This is a wonderful message. I love it because I think it touches the heart of man, soul. The spices then I say to you, I say to you, he bare this kind of thing on the cross. The bitter suffering of Yeshua and Jesus at Calvary. The scripture says in Isaiah 53 and five, it says, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our inequities. So he died carrying all this stuff away from us. I say to you simply, you need to let go and let God. Why are you carrying it? I tell you all the time, tomorrow, tomorrow's worries is its own. It's not yours. Today's troubles is in itself its own. Jesus took all of that. Why are you carrying it? When are you going to let it go? When are you going to put that forgiveness so deep in your heart that love, oh, showers out? Oh, God, that is good. You need to know. You need to know that God sent his only son, the greatest gift of all, to you and me. Oh, somebody, if the yokes and the shackles have not come off of you yet, then I say to you, you're not praying. You're not seeking him. So listen to me. I pray thee, hear me. These spices also emits in our lives when we clothe ourselves with righteous acts and deeds as the bride of Christ. And I say, and spend quality time with him the bridegroom, the husband. Just like when a spouse or a good friend greets you with a hug and is wearing cologne or perfume. Their fragrance then, if it's a good cologne or good perfume, their fragrance lingers with you after they have gone. So then it is with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People will begin to recognize that there is something different, I say, about you when you have been in his presence. We are the fragrance of Christ to our Heavenly Father. As mentioned in the Old Testament, as I mentioned to you, for we are unto God a sweet, sweet Savior unto Christ and them that are saved. And they will not perish. So then you need to understand why Jesus is the greatest blessing. Though 
we did not honor him, I say to you, we did not honor God as we should. And his unbound generosity, he gave the very best and the most valuable thing he had. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So how then do you receive this wonderful gift, this wonderful blessing of Jesus? To receive the blessings, I say blessings with an S, to receive the blessings of Christ, we must actively desire to have him in our lives. We cannot be passive about this. We must seek him in order to find. Heavenly gifts requires an eager, an eager and ready receiver. Oh, praise the Lord, saints. Glory to God. I pray that you have gotten something out of this message today, and I'm praying that you are now covered in his blood. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and it's in the mighty, mighty, somebody say the mighty name of Jesus, the holy name of Jesus, the righteous name of Jesus. Amen, and amen, and amen.